You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. After almost four months at sea, on December 13th at roughly 6.17 a.m., the Admiral Graf Spey opened fire on British warships for the first time. The ships had first sighted one another a few minutes earlier, and in the intervening 17 minutes aboard the Graf Spey, orders had been sent out to get the engines going to full speed and to start working on firing solutions. At that moment, the ships were more than 15,000 meters distant from one another, so determining the exact angle and elevation for the guns was not a trivial matter. The Graf Spey had another problem. As the ship approached top speed, the vibration caused throughout the ship caused a screw to loosen in the forward turret. It was one of the screws that controlled the motors that allowed the turret to move. This meant that at least at the beginning of the engagement that was to follow, the front turret, fully 50% of the Graf Spey's firepower, because it only had two turrets, could only fire on the enemy ship if the ship turned to starboard, which was a serious problem. Meanwhile, on board the British cruisers, efforts were being made to determine what exactly the ship was that was bearing down on them. They would be able to verify its identity as a Deutschland-class cruiser just before it opened fire. And as so often happens with naval engagements, what had taken so long to occur, with the Royal Navy having spent months trying to track down the German surface raiders, would be over in only a matter of hours. This episode will see the story of the Graf Spey come to its conclusion, in the mud of the River Platte estuary. The British cruiser Exeter would be the first target for the gunners on board the Graf Spey, simply due to the fact that it would be slightly closer when the firing started. The first salvo from the Graf Spey fell several hundred meters short of the Exeter, the second straddled the target, and then the third was much closer, sending blast fragments throughout the upper works and damaging the walrus float plane that had been preparing to launch. It was standard procedure, as soon as a surface ship engagement started, or was about to start, to get any aircraft off of the ship due to how vulnerable they were to being damaged by enemy fire, and then also they were a huge fire risk. The Exeter's walrus would not make it off in time, and so it was pushed overboard. Not wanting to be outdone, the Exeter would also open fire a few minutes later at a range of about 18,000 meters. The Exeter was able to fire much more quickly, and after a few salvos, the range had been found, and the sixth salvo would find its target, including a direct hit on one of the Graf Spey's 105 centimeter anti-aircraft gun positions. The shell penetrated into the ship before damaging the freshwater distillation plant on board the Graf Spey, which did not have a huge impact on the immediate combat capabilities of the ship, but when it came to the long-term prospects for a surface raider at sea, being able to distill fresh water was important. During the first few minutes of the engagement with the Graf Spey and the Exeter trading shots, only the rear turret of the Graf Spey had been able to fire due to the problems with the turret caused by vibrations. Of course, the crew had been frantically trying to determine why the turret refused to traverse. Harwood, in the Ajax, was a bit confused as to why the Graf Spey was only using one of its turrets, and even that one seemed to be firing slowly, because it was taking the German ship over a minute to fire a salvo. At first, he assumed that his plan to split the Graf Spey's fire by splitting his forces into two smaller groups was working, because the rear turret was firing on the Exeter, but then the front turret simply did not fire at all. But after a few minutes, the problem, the loose screw, was found by the Graf Spey's crew bringing the forward turret back into action, allowing the German ship to bring even more punishment down on the Exeter. On the German ship's fifth salvo, it achieved a strong hit when one of the shells hit the Exeter's B turret and completely wrecked it, while also sending shell splinters into the bridge, killing many of the people there, and destroying some of the communication and control equipment. To re-establish command and control of the ship, Captain Bell had to move to the after control position, and then rely on a chain of men relaying helm orders verbally from that control position down to the emergency after steering position, in what was a very critical game of telephone. This would allow the Exeter to continue at full speed and to maintain its role in the engagement, which during these opening minutes was mostly as a punching bag for the Graf Spey, as German shells kept landing on or near the ship. Two of the Exeter's turrets continued to fire, but they were unable to find another hit on the Graf Spey during this time. While the focus on the Exeter continued, at about 6.22, the Achilles would fire its first 6-inch salvo, with the Ajax joining a few minutes later. It would take a few minutes for the British cruisers to find their range, though, 
as the first estimates of the distance were very wrong, which resulted in the first salvos from both ships going well over the Graf's Bay. They would eventually correct this error, and as their fire came in closer to the German ship, Longstorff ordered his guns off of the very obviously wounded Exeter and to instead focus on the lead British cruiser of the pair, the Ajax. In response, Harwood would change his course slightly to increase the range between his ships and the Graf's Bay. At around the same time that Harwood turned away from the German cruiser, the Graf's Bay would also turn. This would result in a renewed focus on the Exeter, which had used the brief respite as a chance to launch a torpedo attack on the Graf's Bay, which did not find its target. While the Exeter was severely damaged, it would be around this time that two more hits on the Graf's Bay would be registered by the Exeter's guns, with one shell passing through the superstructure while the other penetrated the armor amidships. This shell would be the most important because it passed through the armor, through a few decks, and then exploded in a workshop. But critically, it hit and severed the connection between the fire control director and the guns, which meant that the Graf Space guns would no longer be centrally controlled, which reduced their effectiveness. Unfortunately for the crew of the Exeter, they would pay a price for this victory. Three more Graf Space shelves would hit the Exeter, one hitting the A turret and putting it out of action, another passing through the forward superstructure before detonating on the other side, and finally, and most damagingly, was the third shell, which penetrated three decks and detonated right above the anti-aircraft magazine. In order to prevent the resulting fire from detonating the magazine, the local decision was made by Royal Marine Sergeant George Puttyfoot and engine room artificer Frank Bond to flood the magazine, probably saving the ship. Having been hit several times, and with only one working turret and taking on water, the Exeter was, by around 7 a.m. local time, no longer an effective fighting unit, but the ship would continue on course, refusing to give up the fight until ordered to do so, although the order would be given to the cruiser to begin making smoke to try and reduce the chances of more hits from the Graf's Bay. Then at around 7.30, the electrical supply for the only working turret failed. For the time being, the Exeter was completely out of action, but over the preceding hour, it had hit the Graf's Bay several times, causing key damage that not just reduced its immediate effectiveness due to the damage to the fire control setup, but also to its long-term prospects to continue its commerce raiding campaign, or even to get back to Germany due to the destruction of the freshwater distillation plant. The impact that the Exeter's 8-inch shells had on the Graf Spey also came as something of a surprise for the crew of the German ship, although it should not have, given the sacrifices that had been made to the Graf Spey's armor scheme to allow for its larger guns and heavy diesel engines. Of course, the Exeter, even if it was out of the battle, was only one of three British cruisers currently within sight of the Graf's Bay. But the turns of the other British cruisers and the Graf's Bay had caused problems for the gunnery of all three ships, and so over the next ten minutes or so, there were a lot of misses on both sides as they grappled with the new range and change rate between the ships. The Graf's Bay would also begin making smoke, which made it even harder for the British gunners to find their target. As with every long-running surface naval engagement, there were periods between 6.30 and 7 when the ships were running parallel courses, then at other times they would be diverging, and then at other times they'd be coming together. If you look at maps of this battle, or really any surface naval action, there's just lines going everywhere. I, I won't worry you too much <laughs> with the exact movements here. Because while the ships were moving, while they were trying to find the range, while they were adjusting the range, the guns just blazed away but there was little damage on both sides. Just before 7 a.m., the Graf Spey would turn to begin heading almost directly west, or towards the South American coast, and the British would change course to the northwest and then to the southwest. At 7.08, the British gunners were finding it very difficult to hit the Graf Spey as it continued to lay smoke, and Harwood decided to reduce the range. This meant that the forward turrets of the British cruisers were the only ones that could fire on target, but the hope was that once their range was closed, all the guns would be brought to bear. Then at 7.16, the Graf Spey quickly changed course, which allowed all of her guns to be fired on the Ajax, which was straddled three times over the following salvos. At this point, the range between the ships had closed down to 8,000 meters, and so the British ships started making their own smoke while slightly altering course to bring all of their guns into action. During this time, the Ajax was hit by a shell which penetrated below the X turret, and exploded, taking the turret out of action. And then another shell directly impacted the Y turret, which jammed the turret, 
so it could not be traversed, essentially taking it out of action as well. With his ship down to just two working turrets, Harwood decided that the next course of action was to launch a torpedo attack, and the Ajax and Achilles made a sharp turn at 724 to fire their torpedoes, a turn that was spotted by the Graspe, which immediately made a hard turn to move out of the expected tracks of the torpedoes, which would work, and the torpedoes would continue harmlessly on their way. At this point, there was a brief break as the Graf's Bay had turned sharply away from the British ships. Aboard the British cruisers, Harwood was rethinking his strategy due to the damage that his ships had already received. The Ajax was down to half its guns, the Exeter was essentially non-functional, and only the Achilles was mostly in fighting shape. And so instead of continuing to closely engage the Graf's Bay, Harwood had his cruisers change course to the east with the intention of trailing the Graf's Bay out of gun range until after dark, when the attack could be renewed. During this time, the captain of the Exeter decided that it was time to disengage and to turn south and to head for the Falklands for repairs. A report also reached Harwood that the Ajax was down to just 20% of its ammunition, which was later clarified to say that it was only for the A turret, but at the time, the A turret was one of the only ones that could effectively fire, so that was still a big deal. After bringing his ships to around 24,000 meters from the Graf's Bay, the British ships turned back to the west to follow. During all of this time, the crew of the Ajax were quickly trying to make repairs, with the first priority being the ship's wireless transmitters, which had been knocked out during the action. Most importantly, at least when it came to the long-term plans of the Royal Navy, was the report that would be sent to London and to the Admiralty about the action that had just taken place and the status of the British cruisers as soon as the wireless was back online. This information would be broadcast several times over the following hours. Another important signal would be a message sent to the Cumberland in the Falklands to come as quickly as possible to replace the Exeter. This first signal was actually corrupted and was indecipherable by the radio crew of the Cumberland, but the captain of that ship, Captain Fallowfield, made an assumption as to its contents and immediately gave orders for the ship to get underway as soon as possible. His guess was later confirmed to be accurate, it was several hours later when another signal arrived, but this would allow the Cumberland to arrive several hours earlier than it otherwise would have, so it was a, a good bit of initiative there. But the expected arrival time of the Cumberland was still 34 hours, so over a day. At around noon, the Exeter was also able to restore its wireless capabilities, and after a situation report was provided to Harwood, he confirmed the Exeter's intention to move to the Falklands at best speed, which was at that time only 18 knots due to the amount of water that it had already taken aboard. During this break in the action, all three British ships would take a moment to hold burials at sea for their dead crew from the morning actions. Hardwood would also consider the longer-term situation that the British cruisers found themselves in. He did not believe they had damaged the German cruiser in any meaningful way. A wrong assumption, but that's what Harwood would base his further actions on. This made Harwood hesitant to commit any more immediate actions, especially when the Cumberland was on the way and would arrive the next day. And the large battle cruiser Renown and the aircraft carrier Ark Royal were only about five days away. All that he really needed to do was keep contact with the Graf Spey until assistance arrived. While Hardwood did not believe that his ships had caused any serious damage to the Graf Spey, as the Germans evaluated the course of the morning engagements, the situation looked much more problematic. The head gunnery officer aboard the Graf Spey would later say that the Graf Spey's quote, own gunnery had suffered through her alterations of course, the spotting difficulties, the handicap of having to engage targets that were abaft the beam, interference to her secondary armament caused by her main armament, and the failure of the after ammunition supply for her second arm uh, secondary armament. In consequence, the achievements of the Spay's guns in the following action were poor. End quote. By the time that the ship broke off, the Graf Spay had been hit twice by Exeter's 8-inch shells and around 18 6-inch shells from the Ajax and Achilles. Unlike the British cruisers, none of these hits seriously impaired the ability of the Graf Spay's guns to continue action, although damage to the main rangefinder and the destruction of the ammunition hoist for the secondary gun turrets made it more difficult to hit enemy ships. Even though the Graf Spay still had all of its guns functioning, it was in a very different situation than any ship of the Royal Navy, because at least in 1939, almost 
anywhere in the world, a ship of the Royal Navy was only a few days away from either a British port or a friendly port, but that was absolutely not the case for the Graf's Bay. And this made some of the damage to the Graf's Bay just as problematic as if it had been one of its turrets that had been destroyed. Freshwater distillation was non-functional. Every galley on the ship had been heavily damaged. Large amounts of food on board had been ruined. There were also some hits to the front areas of the ship that caused some water to be taken on and which would have to be repaired if the ship was to make any adventure through the North Atlantic back to Germany. The ship had also had one officer and 35 sailors killed, along with 60 wounded. As he reviewed his options, Longsdorf would make the decision to make for Montevideo, the nearest major port, although it was a neutral one in Uruguay. The rules for neutral ports were that the Graf's Bay could only stay for 24 hours before it would have to leave, but Longsdorf hoped that that deadline could be extended and the ship could be repaired during that time. Over the course of the evening, the German ship continued on its way to Montevideo, while the British cruisers continued their pursuit, mostly out of gun range. There was one instance where the Ajax closed the distance after 7pm, almost accidentally, but a few quick German salvos caused the British ship to back off again. As the ships approached Uruguayan territorial waters, at which point they would need to stop firing, Harwood attempted to have the Achilles position itself to cause the Graf's Bay to turn away, but the German ship did not, and eventually Harwood called off the Achilles and the Graf's Bay would make it into Montevideo. The two British cruisers would take up positions to block any escape from the German ship, with the Ajax blocking the southern route out of the port while the Achilles manned the northern route. Wireless transmissions were then sent off to London to again fully inform the Admiralty of what the situation was. Meanwhile, the Graf's Bay would drop anchor in Montevideo at around 11.30 p.m. local time. Even before the Graf's Bay arrived in port, news of the confrontation at sea had reached the city, with the four warships being spotted from lighthouses along the coasts. The exact details of the engagement and its results were, of course, confused. At one point, news of a British cruiser being sunk arrived, which was then quickly proven to be false. When Longsdorf entered into Montevideo, he hoped that he could use the excuse that the Graf's Bay was unseaworthy due to battle damage, which would have allowed the ship to stay longer at the port than just 24 hours. This was a loophole in the neutrality rules to allow for any ship to at least stay in port long enough to effect repairs. But in this case, the request was denied. The Graf's Bay would get an extension though, out to 48 hours, which was the amount of time that the Uruguayan government allowed British warships to spend in Montevideo to reprovision. Along with providing time to repair the ship, Longsdorf was also hoping for a longer stay so that U-boats could be sent to his assistance, or at least that was the theory, although there were no solid plans. With only 48 hours, the crew of the Graf's Bay began to effect repairs as quickly as possible, aided by two German merchant ships that were also in port. These ships were able to provide specialty equipment and skilled workers, and further help arrived from Buenos Aires, from which came more specialty workers including a group of elevator engineers who immediately went to work on the ammunition hoists. But no matter what could be done to the ship while it was in port, the clock was ticking. The British ships were still there. Harwood had no problems with the fact that the Graf's Bay was allowed to stay for 48 hours because that allowed the Cumberland to arrive from the Falklands. With the three cruisers now ready to engage the Graf's Bay, the British would find themselves in a very similar position than they had a day prior, when the Exeter had joined the Achilles and Ajax, as the Cumberland was a sister ship of the Exeter. And so it might be impossible to sink the German ship, or it may be very challenging to sink the German ship, but again, the plan was to cause damage, to slow, to delay, to keep contact for as long as possible. Meanwhile, Harwood was in communication with the British consul in Montevideo, with the two of them working together to spread misinformation about the current strength of the Royal Navy in the area. Harwood wanted Longsdorf to believe that the renown in the Ark Royal had arrived. There were many ways in which this misinformation was spread. One of the most interesting was through the use of a simple and single telephone conversation. 
two British embassy officials would have a telephone conversation between Montevideo and Buenos Aires, during which the British ambassador in Buenos Aires was informed that he needed to arrange for 2,000 tons of boiler oil to be delivered to the Mar de Plata naval base on the Argentinian coast so that it could be transferred to two capital ships. These capital ships could only be the renowned in the Ark Royal. But the telephone line was not secure, and the conversation was intercepted and reported to the German representatives in the two cities. This was exactly what the British wanted, though, and the request for the boiler oil seemed to point directly towards the presence of two Royal Navy capital ships in the seas off of Montevideo. But of course we know, and Harwood knew, that those reinforcements had not yet arrived. But Harwood came up with a scheme that involved taking advantage of the rules of neutral ports to maybe delaying the Graf's Bay long enough for them actually to arrive. International law limited the amount of time that a warship could stay in a neutral port to 24 hours, which had already been extended to 48. But it also provided a provision whereby when a belligerent warship was in port, it could not leave within 24 hours of the departure of a merchant ship of another belligerent. This rule was designed to ensure that a warship could not essentially follow the merchantman out of the harbor and then immediately attack. Because of this rule, Hardwood had an idea. There were eight British merchant ships in the harbor, and if it could be arranged for them to leave at a specific time every day, they could delay the departure of the Graf's Bay for several more days, by which time the renown in the Ark Royal would have time to actually arrive. To accomplish this, Harwood was in contact with the British consul, who arranged for the SS Ashworth to leave on the evening of December 16th, which would delay the departure of the German ship until the evening of the 17th. Then, on the 17th, another ship would leave, the British cargo liner the Dunster Grange. While taking advantage of international law to prevent the Graf Spey from leaving until he wanted it to, Hardwood would also ensure that all of his ships were visited by the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Tanker, Olathus, to ensure that the fuel in the ships was not a problem, and with the arrival of the Cumberland, the cruisers were positioned to ensure all exits were watched, while plans were also made to bring the ships together if the Graf Spey made ready to leave so that they could, bind, they could combine their fire on the German ship. They were aided in this by every British merchantman in the harbor, keeping a close eye on the German cruiser and all of them were more than ready to start broadcasting a warning to Harwood the instant the Graf Spey moved. Technically, this was against the rules, and a fine would be imposed. But if the five-pound fine was reimbursed by the Royal Navy, it might be one of the best fivers that the Royal Navy would ever spend. While the British were trying to be clever and preparing for the action to come, Longsdorf was trying to decide what to do. His decision-making was complicated by the fact that he really did believe that the Ark Royal and the Renown were already waiting for him, or were very close, which meant that any hope of breaking out and reaching Germany was simply crushed. It just wasn't going to happen. Longsdorf would discuss the situation with his officers, and they all agreed that the prospects of a real breakout were very, very bad. They also did not want the ship to be interned in Montevideo, due to the belief that it would be quickly sold to the British due to the close relationship between the Uruguayan and the British government. This meant that there were three options, to scuttle the ship, to go down fighting, or maybe just maybe break out long enough to make it to Buenos Aires, which was under 200 kilometers to the west. At that point, the ship would still be interned, but at least it would be with the friendly Argentinian government, where they could be assured that once interned, the ship could at least be sold to Argentina. When the news arrived in Berlin, Raider simply told Longsdorf to use his best judgment, but no matter what path he chose, the overriding concern was that the ship was not to fall into the hands of the Royal Navy. Longsdorf discussed the matter with his officers, and they were much more downcast about the chances of making it to Buenos Aires than Longsdorf was, mostly due to it being completely impossible to leave the port unnoticed, again due to all the British merchantmen. Even with the British efforts to delay the Graf Spey's departure, the clock was ticking and would accelerate when the Uruguayan government announced that after the departure of the Dunster Grange, no further ships would be allowed to depart the port until the Graf Spey either left or was interned. 
With this announcement, Longsdorf gathered his officers so that final plans could be made for what the German ship would do when the time expired. Their belief was that even if they moved out to engage the British ships, the chances of breaking through and making it to Germany were very low, especially due to the lack of maneuverability that would be forced upon the ship by the shallow water and the narrow channels on the way out of Montevideo. This left open the possibility that the ship could be damaged or run aground in a way that would prevent the ship from sufficiently sinking and might allow it to fall into British hands. Getting to Buenos Aires was also going to be a problem, not just due to the British ships, but also due to the mud in the river, which would reduce the efficiency of the already challenged German diesel engines. This was an issue that the British cruisers would also experience, but to a much lesser degree, due to their shallower drafts. All of these challenges resulted in the fateful decision being made that the Graf's Bay would leave Montevideo, the crew would take it to international waters, and then they would immediately scuttle the ship. The officers and men aboard the Graf's Bay were informed of this plan at around noon on December 17th, and they were also told that as many men as possible would be taken off the ship before it set out, leaving only a skeleton crew to bring the ship out of the port. The crew of the Graf's Bay then set about working out a system to scuttle the ship, which was not the easiest thing to do in the world to a warship like the Graf Spey, especially because it did not have scuttling charges. So a plan was developed where the five remaining torpedo warheads would be placed under the engine room. Then they would be surrounded by grenades connected to batteries, which would allow them to be detonated when the circuits were closed. Then at the base of the turrets, shells and bags of gunpowder were stacked so that they would explode, would catch fire and then explode. After this work was done, the entire crew except for 43 officers and sailors, who were moved off the ship and onto the German merchant ship, Tacoma. Longsdorf then relayed the signal to the harbor authorities that he planned to leave at around 6.15pm. The ship then weighed anchor and was on its way, with the intention of moving out into international waters three miles out to sea. The Graf's Bay was accompanied by two tugs and a lighter for the remaining crew members. The charges were set to detonate with a 20-minute delay, and the men on board evacuated onto the accompanying boats. One of the officers who remained on board until the end would later recount, quote, At the very last, we five officers gathered with our captain on the quarterdeck. The flag and pennant were hauled down, and then we got into the captain's launch, which had also come alongside. We went about a mile away and then awaited the moment until the fuse should do its work, end quote. Another sailor would write about what he saw after the charges blew. Quote, ever more columns of fire leap forth. I can see clearly how two of the big guns of the stern turret are turned in the air as if they are toothpicks. The cloud of the main explosion rises over 300 meters and still the explosions go on. The Graf's Bay is enveloped in flames. End quote. The ship settled into the water and into the deep mud. The long adventure of the Admiral Graf's Bay and its crew was over. Back in Germany, when the news of the events in Montevideo were fully known to Hitler and Raider, they were both quite disappointed in Longsdorf's decision to scuttle the ship, instead of to go down fighting. Hitler believed that the Graf's Bay absolutely should have sailed out of Montevideo to take on as many British ships as was possibly there, and to do as much damage as possible. This would prompt Hitler to have Raider issue a new general order to all ships of the Kriegsmarine. Quote, the German warship, fights with the full deployment of its crew until the last shell, until it is victorious or goes down with the flag flying. End quote. This order would have important ramifications for the German Navy in the years that followed. This order, caused at least partially by Longsdorf's decision-making in Montevideo, would not be the last time that Hitler became very obsessed with his men fighting to the end in battles or in confrontations or engagements that really they should not have been fighting. Longsdorf made his decision to save his crew, and in that he was successful. Overall, the entire Panzerschiff experiment would end 1939 in disappointment. The Admiral Scheer was still stuck in port due to mechanical issues. The first war cruise of the Deutschland would be disappointing, with only a handful of merchant ships and the Admiral Graf's Bay having sunk nine ships totaling a mere 50,000 tons. It was a disappointing start to the German surface raiding campaign, although greater efforts would be made in early 1940, with larger ships from the German Navy being sent on these surface raiding cruises. Back in South America, the officers and crew of the Graf's Bay would, for the most part, spend the next six years as guests of the Argentinian government. Some would make it back to Germany during the war, even 
talk about some of them in future episodes. And then in 1946, the rest of the crew were repatriated to Germany on board the Highland Monarch, which was escorted by none other than the HMS Ajax. Longsdorf would not live to be repatriated, because on the night of December 20th, 1939, after writing letters to his parents and his wife, Longsdorf would commit suicide by shooting himself in the head. The missions of the Panzer Schiff were always going to be risky, far from home and greatly outnumbered, and in some ways it's impressive that the Graf Spey lasted as long as it did. The ship itself would be visible for years after the Second World War, slowly sinking into the mud near Montevideo. Salvage efforts as recently as 2004 have attempted to raise the ship to varying degrees of success. Thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope you will join me next episode for episode 159, in which we will begin to talk about the German U-boat campaigns that would start the war.